from an outside the country, he doesn't speak Dutch. I mean, the, uh, he only speaks Dutch. I mean, Dutch. And, uh, and I'm sorry. When we invited him and explained that this was about Dutch, um, Dick has always his ways. And he's brought all the teams for this afternoon, especially. So may we welcome Dick and the president. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Later on, I'll read to you a letter. The name of the guy was Stephen Gray, actually the inventor of the electrical wire. Gray himself gave the name to his experiments the test of the force of attraction. You do understand it when two people feel attracted to each other. How do they express these feelings with a kiss? Can you, in, do you see anything else more touchy than a kiss? <laughs> or, in other words, how is the electrical kiss? How, how did Gray do that? Gray experimented with two bodies apart, apart from each other. How could they still keep contact? How could they not lose contact? Get that electrical wire. Sometimes it wasn't even a wire, it was a rope. Gray himself gave that name, the wire the name, the line of communication. Line of communication. Via electrical wire. Uh, communicated through electrical wire before Gray was impossible. To Gray. Then we had Gray. To Gray. Then we could do. Daarna kwam Stijn. That's fine. We proved it helemaal. Then we proved ourselves we could do it. Daar hebben we dit symbool. You can see the symbol. Gray rolled zijn oefeningen op. Gray started his experiments the 17th of May, 1729. First he started with a distance of 7 meters. He ended his experiments with 265 meters. He written himself a letter and he sent it to the now known as the Royal the Society in London, in London. The, the, February, the, the date that he written that letter was 8th of February, 1731. Because the letter was so important, two in years ago, taal, two years later, it was already translated in Dutch, and was published in the, the semi-scientific magazine. God the name of the magazine was and theology and different religious <laughs> stuff. I'll read out loud all Dutch Let the letter. Let me know. Be careful. I do not give the lecture. I just read out loud the letter. So as you see, I heard you can see already, or actually you can hear also, there's two sound links from Taylor. The first one is Elsa Taylor. She will translate later on the old Dutch of Grace that I read out of this one into sound language. The second sound language will look at her signs and translate them as spoken English. <laughs> they were the, the electrische lading door het stelsel van draden. The same thing was created with electrical force into electrical wires. 
I Die enige is communicated towards the other body. 
that are several feet away from the two. Op de eerste mei beloofde ik een bijzonder bericht op deze experiment aan de maatschappij mede te brengen. Exceptionally experiment to show it to the society. But the other day, I went out and I knew that I had the chance to do the experiment. Like the experience before, I tried to do it alone, but the room didn't have the space enough. The other experiments were thought of. De reeds begon ontdekking zo so, veel verder als hij mogelijk was, eer ik die aan de Royal Society te Londen I the experiment, and then I would send it to the Royal Society, die society in London. op de tanelijk ter uur beoordeling aanbieden. Now I show you the experiment. Ik <laughs> naar buiten op het land. I went outside to the countryside. Het geschiedde op de 2 mei 1799. Met mij nemende verschillende glazen buizen. I took with me several glass tubes. En zodanige andere materialen als ik dacht nodig te zullen zijn. That I thought I niet wel te krijgen zijn. I showed you what I did on the experiment. Now I write to you about the experiments I did. The Northern Court. Where did I do the experiments? The Northern Court. Feverham. Next to Feverham. By my very dear friend, the Ridder. My honourable friend John Godfrey. Andere te Otterden Place. With the other experiment. I did in other places. My dear friend, the Ridder. At my September friend, Knight Grandfield. Here we had a lit of the Koninklijke Maatschappij. They're both associated with the Royal Society. Bekend te worden. Ik zal ieder experiment in volgorde van tijd en plaats als het gedaan is, en gelijk ik het in het aanbieden terugvinden, verslag doen. Except in the same order, so you could see what I did. De eerste proef is gedaan te Nortelkoer. The first experiment in Experiment was done in the North Court. The 14th of May, 1729. Between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock at night. Hebben de mei voorzien van een stok van omtrent 24 foot long. I took a stick about 24 foot. That is 7 meters. Hmm, it's about 7 meters. Die bestond uit een dennenhouten mast, een spaansreet. A spine mass and from a fish reed. And at the top, it has a fishing net. A bulk of cork placed was. Next to that was a cork from the stock stoked in the buis on that seven. I did it in a tube at about seven to eight thumbs wide. Zo trok de bal het daar onderaan de toeslagen bladkoper met de logic experiment met de koper en also with so the force men niet behoefte in twijfel te trekken so we all know niemand doubt about it dat de force van een lange stok veel verder over was from a long to communicate it to the body. <laughs> 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 
would be good for the 30 ste juli ging ik naar Otterdumpes. June the 30th, I went to Otterdumpes. Op te wachten. My friend there, Met Wheeler, I would be there. Met een in kleine massieve glazen stok. I took with me a small glass, elf two. duimen lang, about 11 centimeter. Long. En ik doorsnee That's op about 28 centimeters. duim diameter. En het was dik about 7 eighths. Benevens enige andere vereiste materialen. Voor I had other materials with me. Om de heer Wieler in staaltje voor mijn experimenten te tonen. What I was planning is to show Wieler de what I could do with my experiments. De geschieden uit een venster in de lange galerij. The first, the first experiment I did through a window of the hallway. It's about 16 meters high. The other two was towards the porch, 29 meters high. The other one was from the tower up down. And not the floor. from the stock. So it didn't matter how small the glass tube was, buiten mijn verwachtingen still the copper, even though I didn't expect it, was attracted or dismantled. Was. So was the Heer Wieler begeerig om te onderzoeken of men de aantrekkingskracht niet Wieler wanted to see if, if it didn't matter how high it was, to see if it could be horizontal too. Ik Verhaalde hem mijn pogingen die ik om dat oogmerk te voldoen had in het werkgesteld door zonder vrucht en tegens de wijze van behandeling van de materialen waarvan ik mij verdiend had mijn pogingen gemeld is. Daarop stelde hij voor om een zijde lijn te gebruiken tot draad van de lijn. He said to use silk thread. The silk thread was meant to put the force of attraction through. I thought you can be right. Omdat er dan minder kracht zouden afgetrokken worden. Why? Because there was less force gone away. The less force of attraction. The less force of attraction. The line of attraction would be the hardest way that the Heer Wieler had outgefunden. And with the greatest effort, Wieler himself found out this experiment. As also the help of his friends, he also helped with his servants. The experiment really worked well. The first experiment. The first experiment happened in the gallery. And on the ground for mats. The 2nd of July, 1792. It was about 7 July, 1729. At the wells, both ends on the spikes on the other side of the gallery. From the beginning of the gallery, we had a wire across to the other side. In the middle of the line, there was the end of a rope. Op de zijde kruislijn, de lijn aan de cross bal hing. I hang an ivory ball. De aantrekkingskracht zou de overgebracht worden van de buis tot de bal. The force of attraction was supposed to go through the tube, through the wire, to touch the ball. Tachtig voeten. Dat is 24 meter lang was. The distance was. 80 feet or 24 meters. So that the ball was 9 feet was about 9 feet lower than the cross wire. The other end of the line with a lus on the glass stone. The other end of the line there was a rope end that was connected to the glass rope. Class 2. There was a white paper underneath the ivory ball. On the white paper was copper. The ivory ball did have force of attraction towards the copper. 
opschouwen, middel en terugkeren van de aantrekkende uitvloeiingen van pasend waren. Even though the force of attraction and the results were toch amazing, te onderzoeken. Still, we wanted to try further on to see in how the force of attraction could be brought on into one straight line. De wijze om zoiets te doen was deze. How could we do that? We thought it was about 100 foot here from the end. About 100 foot away, there were two holes, about two foot up, so that they were in the ground. There was a two foot difference between the two holes. There was a two foot difference between the two holes. The poles were in the big yard. The same 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 in the big yard. The big yard is divided by like a river. About four miles. The distance was about four miles. 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 Wire connection was done to them, and the ivory wall was hanging from the flying window. The other line was connected to the flying window. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. The other line was connected to the other line. I rubbed the glass and I seen that the ivory ball did have force of attraction. I then repeated that experiment again. The heavier in the field. Then the wheeler came walking back. The glass itself, of that I. He rubbed the glass and the glass took himself. So I could go to the window and see the ivory ball. Well, I met it. Dat ze zo sterk niet was als wanneer de aantrekking van de bovenkant werd langs een lange lijn en bochtte. De lijn af en de bovenkant af en down. Het is de andere experiment die ik heb gedaan. De lijn was 650 voeten onder het vijf en negen meter. 650 voeten. Van de 195 meter was de distance. This experiment was done a couple of times. But when it's the night, then we were going to try to see how the rain comes setting in. And at seven o'clock in the morning, between then and eight o'clock in the morning, the attraction was gone. I'm not quite sure if it's the water that did it. Or the heat. We don't know. We do not have the answer. What we do there is that last experiment was really hot. The day was really hot. Last experiment was done the 14th of July, 1729. A couple of days later, this experiment was done. Again, also with the same window. In total, it was 765 foot long. In total, it was 230 meters. The force of attraction was still the same. The same as the other experiments that I wrote you about before. The 20th of June, did it the following day. The 20th of June, I did the next experiment. Also steric, so needs steric. I wanted to prove that the force of attraction or the force of disagreement could be brought over to different sides. But the lines don't have to touch each other. I took one line and 231 foot. That's about 7 years. 
blauwe zijde. En hij trok het af tot op de deze zelf. Omtrent 18 voet van elkaar. Omtrent. The difference Die between the two lines was 18 voet. Eén een deze lijn was een andere lijn. On this line was an other line. Same color. Ah, deze. It was also a cell line. Was het ene end. This self line had one end of the rope, and the other end was an ivory ball. There were 13 turns in this line. Underneath the ivory ball, we had a little stand with a cover on it. When I wrapped the glass tube, the cover was pulled up about one and a half thumb. About the middle of June, I went into the middle of the front of the tube together with the old dealer, and I did another experiment. Experiment. To see uh, if force of attraction would be processed into a line without touching the line. This experiment, experiment was done as follows. We took a line from the window out of the dining room towards the yard. By 15 poles, the line was touched. The so-called support points. At every point, there was a line of blue silk about four foot from the two staples. There was a distance from four foot between two support points. Up was in side the line spanned, crossing over the camera. Ten foot away from the room, there was a wire in a cross, and on that support point was the ivory ball. On the cross line of the other stone, other poles, there was a other end of the community wire. The same, the same line as we used before in another experiment. Then I rubbed in my glass tube, and above the line, in different distances, where we had ivory balls hanging, all the way to the other side, then I got it. The copper was attracted really pretty strong, two to three hundred foot was the distance. Because if we were more towards the end of the road, there was less force. Still, the copper was lifted by the ivory ball. Even though we were at the end of it, 870 foot, it was 260 meters long when she was touched by the glass tube. Now I think I have to give you a message about what I found. Over this colored, colored body, I tried to prove which is more or less of the color of the tractation. What I found is that red, orange, yellow is about three to four times stronger with the force of the attraction than blue and purple. But still, what I found out is that I can do my experiments different. And you ask first to keep going with my experiments and then to give you Ik wil hier tenslotte ook bijvoegen. I would like to put this experiment lesson. Nou, we hebben 
op mijn kamer in het jaar 1700. Ik experimenteerde dit in mijn eigen room. In 1700. Ik zweet. In 20 jaar. Ik zweet. 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 In such a way that it was horizontal on the top, with the head of the tobacco pipe downwards. Then I put it in the silver pipe. And I blew. Oh! Then I was rubbing the tube on the pipe. En toen was de aantrekking right op de tobacco pipe. En het blad kon ik het zien dat de force of attraction was high. De hoogte van omtrent en ik kon zien dat de attraction was about two thumbs high. U onderdanige dienaar, Stephen Gray. Ik ben een servant, Stephen Gray. Do remember that this glass tube was at the end of the bed.
Zanotti show. This is short information, and Dick just told me in Dutch that he's ready. So, <laughs> you're invited to go to the bar. Um, but first, a little, uh, uh, there's not a, there were a few questions about the English translation of Dick's work. Uh, he prefers that it's not being translated in English or not. So, in case you are interested in, in what it was about, uh, <laughs> he's still there and now, and, uh, and through us he can be contacted later after the festival. So, this was just. Uh, uh, George um, needs, well, doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Oh. <laughs> uh, George has been uh, very important at Stein. Uh, for quite a bit of people uh, about, uh, well, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, Stein started as a place that was almost anti-computers. And uh, because of the local uh, stories about uh, uh, the way computers were used in music in the then uh, Utrecht-based Institute of Sonology, uh, the use of computers was almost uh, synonymous with, with, you know, sterile music and, and music as an illustration to theories and not as a thing of its own. So there was a real anti-atmosphere uh, at Stein, which is uh, almost uh, unbelievable uh, if you look at it now. But George uh, was one of the first uh, to come in, and, and he personally could really show me that uh, uh, programming is almost like writing poetry, that, uh, that uh, he, he was also the person that said software is not like a general generic tool it's, it's very personal. It's really what you make of yourself and, and how you structure it. And, and there's nothing like, like objectivity in it. Anyway, the way he could talk about it was really like it made sound programming like music. And it, and it got very musical for many amongst us. And I think uh, the way he could, you know, without using too many words even, uh, make us really positive about the fact that, that software could be tackled and that you could create your own instruments with it, and it, it could be like personal instrument. I think that contribution has definitely been very, very important for the way many people now work at Stein or the guests that come at Stein uh, treat uh, software as something uh, personal. <laughs> to say. Well, George, is that all for you? That was nice to you. Um, I hope that. Okay. Um, well, um, and now it's back to theory. Exactly <laughs> all that poetry, it's all over now. <laughs> I just want to talk a little bit about, oh, let's see, a little bit, that's not too long now, about a few issues of discourse and practice that I've encountered over the last, I guess, I guess, 20 years of doing music with computers. Um, so I just, some of my experiences and some of my personal hobby horses and um, some of them, I think the, the good place to start for me was when I started looking at, I read, you know, the, um, the uh, this is the, the essay in the, in the, <coughs> in this program. And the essay being a person that came out of African American music, uh, notably jazz music, um, usually or very often there's a kind of a, a head that you play. You play this sort of theme, and then this theme gives you some sort of something to bounce off of. Sometimes, it, sometimes it gives you some information that you can use in the course of whatever you're going to do later in your improvisations. So I'm, I'm going to take a, a part of this essay and use it as my kind of head. And there's a part where it talks about, um, <coughs> here we are, we're talking about, I'm not quite sure where to go with this, um, how the same technological extensions that take us beyond previous corporeal limits perversely narrow our movement range. How we evolve in the digital, physical world essentially depends on our dealings with keyboards, mice, joysticks, and touch screens. And, and, um, you know, there is really something to that, but 
I think it might be interesting to reflect on at least some of the ways that we've come to that point. Um, how um, you see these keyboards and mice, joysticks, etc., have now become really part of an everyday vernacular definition of what interactivity is, which I, I found very interesting because before really any of this stuff was around, people were doing this thing called interactive computer music. And so I found that, for me, interactivity was a term that actually got hijacked away from the people that started it. That's not unusual. You see, you start to find that all kinds of terms become redefined by more powerful people, such as the term alternative, with, um, now, or, or, or any number of other terms like this new music, which is um, uh, contemporary, which now means Kenny G, okay. um, and, even, and even electronic music, which now refers to techno. Um, so what we're talking about is, and of course, don't even think about jazz, which really doesn't mean anything. So, so colon, the, the term is so colonized and so valorized, it means absolutely nothing. So at this point, when you, when you say that word, no one has any idea what you mean. So, but you might want to, so I'll get to that again, but I just wanted to point out to you that um, there were, and part of the, the text says that as well, that um, part of what Stein and has been involved in and part of what a lot of other people have been, have been involved in is the idea of trying to um, find a way, not find a way past keyboards and mice because you know, the stuff that people made existed before that. So I'm going to play some of those conceptions for you. Um, so I'm, so the, um, the, the title, that, well, one of the, things we, one of the things I developed a while ago to think about this problem was um, an electronic embira. I don't know if people know what that is, but it's the sort of African or Zimbabwean instrument that you play with your thumbs and sometimes with your fingers, and it has these metal keys on it. You hold it in your hand, and you kind of play it like that. And um, the thing is, the very physical is written that really exemplifies the notion of touch. And um, when, we start, when I started to uh, try to design, along with David Behrman, my um, mentor and, uh, and collaborator, we started to design. He originally had the idea to make an electronic computer, and we sort of both put it together. Um, so I'm just... I'm calling this talk, I guess, for lack of a better term, of mice and embiros. So, um, basically, um, <coughs> um, what, what I want to really discuss in a way is the idea of touch as being a social phenomenon, interactive meaning dialogic at the least, in other words, taking place in an environment that we have to think about as something that actually allows notions of touch to be understood. Um, you know, there, there's a moral dimension, a cultural dimension. There, you know, someone talk, talked about pleasure this morning. Well, there are also, of course, touches that are not that pleasurable. There are notions of good touch and bad touch. So there's a lot of contingency there. And I'm not going to try to unpack all of that, but I'm going to try to win my way through it with reference to certain ideas I found in work that I'm going to present that I think uh, brings up some of these kinds of issues. But the basic thing for me has always been interactivity, meaning to me, when you touch it, does it touch you back? Um, and w Or does touch become a form of control or even mastery or the articulation of power? And one of the things that I've started to find in um, the way computer music instruments and our name uh, brings up issues of, of control and, and power, which um, are sort of very strange as far as I can see. Um, the notion of controllers being one, and, I guess, and we're, I'm going to show some examples, or one example of a so-called mini controller that I'm using. Um, but when you, when you think about the notion of controllers, you know, I don't really think of music as something... Well, controllers is sort of... A, I think of it as a non- dialogic way of, of describing or, or, or talking about or naming uh, the, intera the interaction that I think is taking place. So I keep trying to get out, of the, get out of the discourse of control, get out of the discourse of mastery, you know, the master-slave uh, business. You know, I mean, given, given my own history and background, it, I, I really I didn't see much utility or interest. I didn't have a lot of interest in the, in the notion of control or the whole discourse of mastery. And control, and I start to see that as basically arising from uh, basically another culture. So, or a, a culture with which I have some 
linkages, but which by dint of race or ethnicity have always been defined as kind of an outsider in. So that sort of international thing, we're not talking about one country or another. I think it's sort of an international phenomenon. And you can dispute that and we'll get to the question period. And you can talk about how there's no racism in this country or that country. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, for right now, uh, I'm going to assume that from my own experience, these things are international and that there is sort of a, a global or, or, or pan, a global notion of a present and a sort of pan-European notion of, of this discourse of mastery and control, which is reflected in, which unfortunately the problem is with this is it gets right into the interface design of the computer music instruments, right into the software, right into the manner of speaking about it, so that what you start to see is that the, the instruments, the software, the hardware, the interfaces reflect the community that produced them and reflect some of that community um, uh, 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 most closely held uh, and deepest beliefs. And some of those beliefs, when you start to unpack them, become pretty unsavory. Um, for example, if you start to think about uh, uh, the whole business of using the mouse or things of this sort, and you start to find out how actually, you know, I play the trombone. Now, the trombone is a very stupid instrument to play. There's not much to it. You do this, and you go, that's all you do. Now, if you, but imagine, that's, that's, it ends up being a very variable situation. Now, with the mouse, there's basically two things. You kind of do this, and you click all the time. And then they give you little objects on the screen to click on. And then from there, you're sort of retrieving information which has been provided for you by um, Microsoft or whoever the current corporate giant is. And, and so this, this information retrieval uh, um, paradigm becomes one which, when it enters into the aesthetic domain, when it enters into the domain of music, when it enters into the domain of the body, um, the question that I have as to whether we can, whether, whether enough information is there, whether enough can we really place our personalities, our beings, our histories, our, uh, can we express these through the use of these devices? And um, so my feeling is probably not, and um, that these things are sort of designed, in fact, they're very convenient at this point, but they've been convenient ways in which we can homogenize experience or lock out alternative narratives and decide that, well, this is the way information should be retrieved, this is the way that we should dialogue with technological instruments, this is, in fact, this is sort of, in a way, becomes definitional for what technology is, or it becomes expression of what technology is. Um, however, let me let me sort of say this. Um, we keep talking about technology, okay? But I sort of got interested for the making of a piece called Virtual Discourse. I got interested in Santeria, which is the um, uh, Cuban or Afro-Cuban um, form of religious music which is what you could be called, call it that, um, largely performed on percussion, percussion instruments and voices. And Santeria really is a kind of technology, and it's a kind of touch technology. Um, and uh, it was pointed out, for example, I think it was Paul Feyerabend who pointed out that voodoo was a kind of technology. And um, so that really Santeria is, I think of that in the same way, if you're understanding technology as interacting with the environment, Really, with the, with, the, with the purpose of affecting some desired changes or interacting with it or causing some sort of movement. But the difference is in, I think, lies along this fault line that I have between prosthetic technologies and incarnative technologies. Now, when we spoke about um, uh, the, east, the East and West, the, the wings versus ecstasy, this is a rough version of that, yeah. um, the idea. That uh, if you look at a lot of the technologies that have been developed, the so-called controller technology is all totally prosthetic discourse. You stick something on yourself, and you sort of extend what you do. Put something on your hand, and your hand gets big, or something along those lines. Well, that's really what's happening. <laughs> But you see, um, the, I, I think of the incarnative, or I'm thinking more of an animistic conception of technology, where one more or less breathes life into the technology, and the technology really takes on a life outside of yours. In other words, it's not, it's not something you stick on and you sort of, and you sort of run it in a matter of a cyborg conception, but more that something that you become, or that becomes something that you uh, can then sort of become sort of different from you and with its own sort of codes, to use that term that someone used today. Um, I'll give you an example of what that means, the difference 
Here's a, is, there's an interesting example in Francis Bebe's introductory book on African music, in which um, someone, well, for example, if you think about this something called a musical instrument, now already we've got problems with the term instrument right off the bat, because because <laughs> this, this notion of something you sort of you sort of you, this sort of ready to hand device, this sort of suhan type thing you sort of grab and you take and you sort of use. And it's, it has, it's, this thing is instrumental to your desires. Um, and uh, so this notion of the whole story is flawed right away by the fact of the, tra of the translation of the words we have to use. But for lack of better terms, what, what we have is someone hands this African musician a uh, quote musical instrument and says, well, why don't you play this? And he looks at it for a while and kind of plays with it or does, you know, does, investigates it. And then finally says that, well, I can't really do anything with this instrument because it doesn't speak the same language that I do. And I thought that was a very interesting thing because most of the time when I use computers, I'm trying to get them to speak for themselves. And I sort of want to hear what they have to say at the end. And I sort of want to talk back and I want to have this back and forth dialogue. And I, I never really was attracted to prosthetic uh, computer music technology. Um, so that um, I much prefer the animistic conception, and I didn't really make the connection with anything in my past, either either presumed past or constructive past or history or anything like that. But then when I started to look more carefully at the the kinds of music I had been doing, I started to see that there there was a it was instrumental to why I think about technology the way I do. Um, another sort of story, so there is this animistic conception related to this kind of work that I'm about to, to show. Um, the other thing about it is, is that there's a notion of sound, which is, I think, a little different than what we encounter, particularly in, I think, uh, European, pan-European contemporary music, which is the idea that, that sound, in other words, sound becomes really a symbol of personality. So you have your own sound, you know, and your own sound is a pointer to a kind of personal narrative that you're expressing. And uh, this is where, this is sort of the Charlie Parker um, quote, in which he says that your, well, let's see, music is your thoughts, your wisdom, something like that. If you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. So what we start to see is that um, uh, computer music devices, instruments, or something that somehow is letting you touch, letting you interact, should, should not really lock out your histories or memories. And so what I'm, what I'm sort of agreeing with about this morning's discussion then is that there is, in, there is right now a danger of locking out the instantaneous, the spontaneous moment. But I think that's a minor danger because spontaneity, spontaneity is going to break out anyway. You can't really do much about it. You have to do some pretty severe things to lock out spontaneous motion. But it's, it's paradoxically a lot easier to lock out histories um, and to, and to, uh, to so that, that's when we are sort of speaking against or trying to figure out ways which the computer will, can be constructed in a way where these won't be locked out. Um, so there's a lot of stuff here. It's all kind of in a mess. I'm trying to win my way through it. Um, so basically, I don't want to abandon my history when I use computers. I don't want the computers to distance, distance me from myself. And what I'm looking for is also kind of a... I'm looking to ask the question of how personalities and identities become articulated through sound. I think that's something we have to sort of uh, think about in our own lives. And rather than, I could give you my example, but I invite you to think of your own examples. And I think you'll start to see that pretty soon. You will see that at every moment, there's, um, there's, a, there's a construction of identity just in the way you use your voice, which is something that everyone is very virtuosic at using and knows how to use. And basically improvises with at every moment. So, and, and very clearly, people think of their voices as direct uh, expressions of who they are. And, but you start to find that when you really think about it, there, you know, not only have you been involved in the construction of this personality, but other people have been too. They've taught you how to say certain things. They've taught you what to say, what not to say. They've taught you which words are transgressive. They've taught you about the tone of the voice. There are all kinds of ways in which um, this is a constructed uh, personality. But nonetheless, one which we connect with ourselves, which one which we use to articulate who we are at every moment. So right away, the sonic aspect about that is important. The other thing, one other thing I wanted to sort of um, 
really put on the table right now, and I appreciate it also putting this on the table, was that it's important to locate technology in terms of culture, and really in terms of almost a tribal conception. Uh, for me, um, computer music te technology comes from a, a, a small group of tribes uh, which who have a great deal of influence. Sort of, sort of like Western music comes from a small group that has a very great influence and a lot of power. So 